got our teens uh, getting together during uh, our worship service, so you guys are dismissed to go outside. It's a beautiful day outside. We're so thankful to see our teens coming back together. We're thankful to see our church family coming back together, and man, what a beautiful day it is. Uh, I do want to quickly touch on our relationship with COVID-19. Uh, I know there's a lot of information going around, uh, you know, what, 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 what are we going to do, but, but our attitude towards COVID-19 is that we want to coexist with COVID-19, right? I realize cases uh, might be going up, uh, headlines can be scary, but our medical community is in a different place than they were in March. We're better prepared, our treatments are better, our data is more helpful, and so yes, we are praying that COVID-19 would go away, the Lord would heal our lands, uh, but until then, uh, we're aiming to coexist with COVID-19, which means Man, we want to wear masks, we were going to social distance, we're going to wash hands, and we're going to try to enter into the normalcy of life. Uh, we know that some people are absolutely isolating uh, from others because of health reasons. We support that decision. But if you're, you know, going out to the office, to school, getting on a plane, traveling, man, come and worship with us for an hour and talk to us about child care. We're trying to be as creative as possible to make it as easy as possible. Now, overall, super encouraged by how our church family has navigated this season. Uh, overall, doing an amazing job. Uh, so if you have questions, if things are confusing, we want this to be a dialogue. So come and talk with us. But as of right now, coexist with COVID-19. We're kicking off a new series here with uh, Arguments. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we looked at how Jesus responds to the argument around life after death, and today we're going to talk about politics. I was reading an article uh, where the author made the observation that the follower of Christ is comfortable talking to their friends about sexual addiction, financial debt, marital conflict, childhood hurts, but in today's climate, wants to avoid political discussion at all possibility. And why should we get in political conversation, right? The, the amount of news information out there is massive. Uh, the quality is poor. It's emotionally charged. Uh, and it would seem like it's unwise to engage in political conversations, especially with this philosophy of critical race theory. I don't know if you noticed, but it's influencing a lot of our language today so that words like uh, racism and white privilege and white supremacy, they're all loaded with the same words but different definitions so that it's really complicated to talk about politics so that we could, you know, think to ourselves, why would we even get close to a political conversation? Well, the answer is simple, really. We engage political conversations because Jesus has called all those who are in Christ, all of us who are in him, to go and make disciples. And making a disciple means that, that we, we're talking about our lives, the whole of our lives coming under the lordship of Jesus, and that includes politics. So today we're going to look at Mark 12. We're going to see how Jesus engages this argument, and we're going to look at three subpoints: the background, the rebuke, and the training. So let's look at verses 13 to 15. Let's talk about the background. Mark 12, verses 13 to 15 says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him, that's Jesus, in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Now, you need to know that Mark 12 is highly electric. Now, this conversation has taken place on a Monday or on a Wednesday. And Jesus is going to be put to death on a Friday. And so th the context is like that Monday, uh, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. People are singing, praising his name, Hosanna, glory to God. And then on Friday, they're going to be crying out, crucify him. So that Wednesday is very pivotal, right? Wednesday is very uh, 
filled with tension. Uh, in Mark 11, Jesus has just rebuked the hypocrisy of the religious leaders for taking financial gains in the temple. Tables have been turned, debris is scattered, dust is settling. And then in verse 13, it says, They sent in some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. The they in verse 13 is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are the uber religious people in Israel. And the Sanhedrin are watching to catch Jesus in a trick question. Right? It's just like we talked about last Sunday. They think they have Jesus backed into a corner. Right? The old Kobayashi Maru, the unsolvable problem. They think they got Jesus pinned in. And so they ask this question, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar? Now the first thing you need to know about this poll tax, it's a little different than tax in our day. The poll tax in Mark 12 was a specific tax that was required to be paid by every person based on the census. And the poll tax wasn't even that much. The poll tax was equivalent of like a quarter, but it was the principle of the matter because uh, Israel was already paying taxes, uh, paying land tax to Rome, grain tax, oil tax to Rome, wine tax to Rome. And this was just another way for Rome to kind of get their thumbs and oppress Israel. So historically, you know, there's a lot of violence around the poll tax. Historically, there's a revolt that's taking place, and, and these Pharisees and these Herodians, they come to Jesus, and they ask, is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar? And this would have, I mean, the people would have leaned in, like the crowd would have quieted, like, what's he, what's he going to say? The second thing you need to know is that the Pharisees and the Herodians kind of represented both sides of the argument. The, the Pharisees were the religious leaders in Israel. So if Jesus says, pay the tax, I mean, the, the Pharisees uh, would have been there to kind of gasp, like, pay the tax. So th that means you're for oppression. That means you're against Israel. That means you don't care about the people. Like, oh, right? And then the Herodians, they're kind of the political group in the story. So they're kind of leaning towards Rome. And so if Jesus says, don't pay the tax, then they would have gasped, like, oh, you know, like, we're going to run and tell Rome, you're about to start a revolt. And so, like, both sides are being represented. So this is a tense conversation. Uh, this is, you know, like, you go home for Thanksgiving, you got an uncle or a nephew or somebody in your family that's like, so what's your position on abortion? Right? It's just like, are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? Well, if you're pro-life, I mean, I guess you don't care about women's rights. Well, if you're pro-choice, I guess you don't care about infants' lives. Like, which one are you? Like, where you feel kind of, like, cornered, pinned in. Second Amendment, are you constitution or are you for blood and death? Like, which one? <laughs> it's, this is like this, this, this tense. That's the background of Mark chapter 12. So let's see how Jesus is going to respond. Look at the verses 15 to 17, the rebuke. Verses 15 to 17. But he, Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. It's at this point in the story that most politicians would look in the camera. They ask about poll tax. The politician looks in the camera. Tax? You're asking about tax? When, when Sarah can't send little Johnny to school, you're asking about tax? You know, totally dodge the question, but that's not what Jesus does. Jesus knows the heart of men. He knows our hypocrisy. And he says to them, why are you testing me. It's a rebuke, especially in the original language. It's the idea of a trap, like, like, a, a, like a bait that's put there for a little, a little animal that's going to crush his lives. He's just like, why, why are you, what are you doing, right? He, 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 just, he goes right to the, to the heart of it. So when you're at home with Thanksgiving, when you're with that, that family member, and they, they say, what's your position on this agenda or that agenda? Just say that to them. Why are you, why are you testing me, right? Like a Jedi. Why are you testing me? <laughs> and then just kind of sit there real chill like and like I uh huh right so, <laughs> so Jesus says 
bring me a denarius to look at. Let's pull up a, a denarius. We know a lot about denarius coins that, because we found them. Uh, you can see them in museums. They're a silver uh, coin. They have an image of Tiberius Caesar on the coin and then an inscription uh, that says, Son of the divine Augustus, Caesar Augustus, that when Augustus died, it was said that he became a god. And so that Tiberius is son of a god. And so this was this makes the Roman coin like an act of worship. It's a, it's a relic of worship. And, and, a, and a faithful Israelite wouldn't have one of these coins on them. Like a faithful Israelite would have known of Exodus 20, to have no graven images of worship, that they would abandon those things. They would have, you know, kind of grasped onto like shekels and, and copper coins. And so Jesus knows their hypocrisy. And with that one question, who has... Who has a denarius? He's exposing their hypocrisy. He knows the hypocrisy. Then he exposes the hypocrisy because somebody in the group reaches in their pocket. They're like, I got one. <laughs> like it would have been one of those moments where everybody in the crowd just like, no, nah, I don't have a, I don't have a denarius. And then it's like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, you idiot, you can't do that. Like, and so he, in one little question, he exposes the hypocrisy. He levels the playing field. I mean, that's something we need to keep in mind when we think about political conversations uh, with other people. That when you get into a political conversation, it just bleeds self-righteousness, doesn't it? It just bleeds out pride and arrogance where we get to kind of elevate ourselves and look down on, the, oh, what an idiot. Like, how could? And so with one little question, who has a denarius coin? It levels the playing field. And then Jesus asks, Whose likeness and inscription is this? Pull up verses 15, 16, 17. You see, say, everybody knows the answer, right? They say it's Caesar. Jesus says to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And render to God the things that are God's. And in that moment, a hush falls over the crowd. They're in awe. You know Why? It isn't just about the hypocrisy. Like he levels it with hypocrisy, but when Jesus says, look at that image, they say Caesar. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. I mean, everybody in that listening audience is bearing the image of God. That every human being is an image bearer of God, and so he says to them, render to God the things that are God's. You feel that? It might not land on us as heavy, but you need to know, man, everybody in that audience knows Genesis 1, Let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our likeness. Whose likeness is this? Whose image is this? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Every human being bear, being image bearers of God. Render to God the things that are God. The religious leaders are saying, what about Caesar? Jesus is saying, what about God? Man, we're thinking too small. Right? When we're in these political conversations with people and we're getting kind of swept up, of what about, what about abortion? What about Second Amendment? It doesn't mean those things aren't, aren't important, but, we're, but it's so easy to get, you know, so, so, so myopic in those conversations. He's just drawing our, our eyes. He's lifting our eyes. Saying, what about God? I mean, are we getting caught up with who wins the election or, 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 or this position or that so that we're losing sleep over it, that we're filled with anxiety and fear, that we're cutting off relationships because of what somebody said or didn't say, that we're lashing out, we're justifying, spewing hatred onto other people? Mark 12, Jesus is lifting our eyes. What about God? I mean, Jesus has been, has been talking about living in his kingdom on earth, right? That we're, 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 we're living out on earth as they are in, in heaven. The Apostle Paul picks up the same language, and he calls us to live as heavenly citizens. That our citizenship isn't in Rome. Our citizenship isn't in just the United States of America, but in Christ, we're heavenly citizens. We have a new purpose. You're image bearers of God. What about God? Are you thinking through that lens? Are you having a broader scope? 
The Apostle Paul has that, the Apostle Peter picks up on that same language when he describes us as aliens and strangers, that we're exilers, that this isn't our home, that in Christ, that when we profess with with our our mouths that Jesus is Lord, we believed in our hearts that, that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, that we've been transferred, right, from the domain of darkness to live in the kingdom of his beloved Son, What about God? So what what does that look like practically? Let's talk about the training. Let's look at the first one. And the first one, just to pull out of the passage, all people are image bearers of God. When it comes to getting into political arguments with other people, we need to remember that all people are image bearers of God. Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Green Party, Kanye, are all image bearers of God. And people we should, respe- re- we should treat with respect and honor. Can't you imagine how difficult it must have been for Jesus to stand in that conversation as the Pharisees and the Herodians condescended towards him? Imagine what that must have been like for Jesus creator of all things, humbling himself as he listens to his creation lie to him, manipulate him, try to deceive him, trick him, trap him. Imagine what that must have been like. And yet Jesus constantly speaks with respect because we're created in his image. We're created beings in the same way. Just because someone posts or spouts a political position that we disagree with doesn't give us the right to spew hatred, to condescend, to mock with our words or in our heart. It doesn't give us the right to do that, even if it's unbiblical. We can't justify getting on social media and Yelling at people because it's not biblical? What? what? (laughs) I mean, by our profession of the gospel, we've admitted we're all sinners. If we're all sinners, that means we're all going to be talking about these things with limited understanding, right? No matter how well we've researched it, as sinners, we all have, whether we admit it or not, we all have a limited understanding around any political subject matter. Therefore, let us lead out with humility. Let us lead out with honor and respect towards other people. Listen to me. I'm not saying we just listen, smile, and walk away. Not at all. Now more than ever, the body of Christ needs to be speaking up. Right now, our culture is highly influencing how we talk about these things. They're training us, whether we admit it or not. Our culture is training us on how to have these types of conversations. Now more than ever, we can't shrink back. We must speak up and we must model. We who are in Christ model an attitude of humility and respect and honor for all people. Let's look at the second one. Have political discussions become spiritual distractions? I phrased it as a question, but it's really a statement. It was my attempt of being gentle. Have our political discussions just become spiritual distractions? You know, in the context of Mark 12, everyone's getting their world rocked. And it just seems really convenient that the religious leaders show up and like, but what about Rome? But what about poll tax? (laughs) Is it possible they're using a political distraction to, to, to get away from what the Lord is wanting to do in them in this moment? I mean, Mark chapter 11, right? He's flipping tables, the temple. He's calling out hypocrisy. I mean, it's tense. Mark chapter 12, read it on your own. Jesus gives a parable of a vineyard owner who sends his son. And the people kill the son. 
The workers killed the son. And everybody listening to the parable knows the vineyard owner is father, the son is Jesus, and the religious leaders are the workers. Like, it's just really tense in that moment. It's in that moment that the religious leaders, the elite, say, uh, what, about a, what about a tax? I mean, is it possible that we're allowing political discussions just to become spiritual distractions? For us personally, is it possible that the Holy Spirit is pressing, pressing in on our fears and doubts with all the insecurity that we have right now in our medical community, our economic community, in our government community, in our families, in our in our church families, our, so many insecurities, so many fears and doubts, and are we just covering it up with more stats and data about COVID-19? Is it possible that the Holy Spirit is pressing in on our lack of compassion towards others, our lack of ethnic diversity in our lives, our, our favoritism, our racism, our bias. And instead of dealing with that, instead of being honest with that and coming before the Lord, we just cover it up with stats, data. Do you know there's a poll tax in the United States in the 1960s, the Jim Crow laws. Established to hinder blacks, Native Americans, Hispanics, poor people, poor white people from voting. That's in our country. That's real. Man, are, are we allowing political chat, articles, podcasts just to cover up what the Lord is wanting to do in us? Is it possible that the Holy Spirit is pressing in on our gossip, on our slander, on our harshness, on our tone, on our pride and our arrogance? And we're just scrolling through political firestorm after firestorm. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit is pressing in on sexual immorality? pornography, lustful thoughts that we are turning to because of the stress and the anxiety in our days, and we just keep covering it up? Now listen to me. Those types of conversations with the Holy Spirit are hard. When God's Word presses in on us, there's a reason People aren't gathering for worship right now. And it isn't just because of COVID-19. Right? There's, a, there's a spiritual avoidance that, that's rampant in us right now. And it's so much easier just to go to Facebook, scroll through Facebook. Look at this idiot. <sighs> I do this in my life all the time when I get into arguments with my wife. Right, have you had one of these moments if you're married where your, your spouse has you dead to rights, like you know black and white, like you're wrong. And she has me backed into a corner, and I just need to humble myself and say, you're, ri you're right, I did it, I'm sorry. But instead, I say, oh, oh yeah? Well, what about that over there? <laughs> and then we start talking about that over there. We don't have to talk about it over there. <laughs> it's called the art of distraction. Wait, in Mark 12, it's Wednesday. The Lord is pressing in on their hypocrisy. And they start talking about politics. In the same way, we would all do well to take a step back from politics and ask the Lord, ask our spouse, ask our community group, am I just using this political chatter to distract me from the Lord? Let's talk about the last one. Be a blessing. In the New Testament, there's two types of uh, groups that were uh, existing. Uh, and though, the, you see this kind of similar to today as well. There was a group called the Essenes. 
And the, uh, the Essenes were a, a people that just went and uh, hid in caves. They saw all the revolts that were going on. They saw the oppression. They saw the political chatter that was taking place, and, and they, just, they just took off. Right? This is where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, because th- these were people that, hey, we don't want to deal with it at all. We're going to go hang out in a cave. And, like, man, you got to know that's a real feeling in us right now. Man, as you're just seeing these things, like, kind of just bustling around us in this political discussion, like, how many of us are like, I'm moving to Canada. Like, I'm just, I'm going to the mountains. Like, even if we didn't go physically, like, maybe emotionally or mentally, we feel this, like, I am checking out, man. I'm going off the grid, right, because it's just so chaotic right now. We feel that leaning. I, I, I was driving with my wife down uh, Mopac just the other day, and you know when you drive in a car, I cut somebody off, and I saw them. They just give me one of these. Like, come on, man. Like, and I just thought, that's kind of 2020. You know, where you're just like, what? Like, come on, man. 2020 is just, you just, you feel that, that, that pull to want to run. There's the Essenes. The other group in the New Testament would have been the Zealots. The Zealots would have been all about the action. Zealots would have been all about the protests, the riots, the revolt, the fight. You feel that pull too, don't you? Man, you see those people caught on camera at Costco just going off and yelling at people, and I'm like, dude, that could be me. Like, I'm not that, I'm just wound up. Like, I'm not that far away from, from that person. Like, you feel like, you, know, you do it on social media, you're like, it's, it's time. I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to take my stand. I, I put my sign in the yard. Have you seen that sign that says, like, I'm so going to vote? I'm just like, what have you been doing? Like, just like, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so going to vote. Like, it's just like, you feel the... But Mark 12, Jesus is teaching us, whose image do you bear? You've been called out of darkness, been transferred into his kingdom. You're heavenly citizens. You're exiles, aliens and strangers who are called to live in this world, to be a blessing in this world, to be salt and light. To live in his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to me. I get it. I feel the pull to want to run. I feel the pull to want to lash out. But God's word is asking us to lean in. To be resilient. To persist. To persevere, we have been indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit that resurrected Christ from the dead. There is nothing that is too great for us. Lean in. Be resilient. Keep pressing in. And like, look, uh, let's be honest. We're probably not going to change legislation. I don't want to limit you. I don't know what the Lord has for you, but the president is probably not going to call us on the phone and say, what do you think I should do? But, but we have been given incredible influence in our families, in our marriages, in our workplace. Acts 17 says he's determined the times and places in which we leave. It is no accident he has you in that workplace for this season, in that family, with that family member, in this church family, in this neighborhood. There is incredible opportunity for us to have incredible influence to, to keep pressing in to him to be salt and light. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians, do not grow weary in doing good. In due time, we will reap. In due time, Jesus will return. His throne will be established. His glory will rain down. There will be a harvest. Be a blessing. Specifically, look for it. Lean into it. Will you bow your heads with me? Well, Father in heaven, I thank you for today. I thank you for every man, woman, and child you have here that gets to gather as a church family. What an exciting time we live in in 2020. What exciting opportunities you've given us. 
And so I pray, I, I pray that, that, that every man, woman, and child in you would see every person as an image bearer. That we would be looking internally of where do we need to grow? Where do we need to repent? What are we overlooking? And that we would seize every opportunity to be a blessing. If there's somebody here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you would soften their hearts, that you would open their eyes, that you would call them to yourself. That today they would make the decision to know you. That today they would make the decision to give their life to you and that they would be eternally changed. Father, would you do that today? Would your glory reign out? Would your name be proclaimed? We trust you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.